going to recognize this. This is a scripture that is often uh, quoted as we take communion. But I'm going to start here. It says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now what I want you to imagine, what he's doing is he's imparting something to the disciples. He's imparting unity to them in this time. He's saying, this is me, now I abide within you. And it's up to you as the founders of the church to, to start this union together, to make sure that you are unified. Because what Paul's writing on, actually the interesting, the notation in Corinthians, actually this is the end of my sermon. Um, what Paul's doing in Corinthians is he is coming radically against this disunity that somehow got into the church. There was a lot of discord that was happening. And so Paul's purpose in this, if you go back in your homes later tonight, read prior to what I just read to you, what you see is that when they would come together to take of the, the Lord's communion, is that there was fighting, there was quarreling, there was people rushing into the, into the process. And Paul's like, do you not understand what you're doing? And he's drawing the church's minds to remember what the Lord did in this moment. It's sacred. It is something that the Lord set aside for the church to partake in to remember what he has done for us. And so listen to what he says. He keeps going and he says, this is my body which is for you. Do this and remember to me. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant. Say amen. amen. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's not the end all. He continues to say, So then, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves. Say, examine themselves. Examine themselves. When I, my mom told me to clean my room back in the day, and I, she would never take my word for it. The audacity of my mother. Because I would go into my room and I would hide stuff places. There was one that had a better authority and a better knack of knowing where I'd hide things that would come in and examine my room and she would find stuff that I would set aside. So the Lord gives us this opportunity to examine ourselves but also knowing that the Holy Spirit's gonna come in and check those little corners and stuff that we try to shove aside and we try to justify so before we get into communion today, I want to tackle the scripture and this cultural mentality that I believe has been the assault on what pastor just prayed on, the marriages and the union of Christ and his church by these little words that the enemy whispered into Adam's wife's ears. Did God really say? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 because I'm going to get to the foundation of where we're going. I'm going to pray first. Father, I thank you that you've given not just Marysville Assembly of God, not just the Assemblies of God, you've given the global universal church the foundation by which we would all stand and by which we would have a standard, a code of conduct of how to, in, how to interact with each other and how to interact with the lost, and that is your word. Father, I pray that we would acknowledge your word as being infallible, that it's divinely inspired, and that it can resonate. You, you, your word speaks that you sustain all things. You strengthen all things by your powerful word. And Father, I pray that that would be on the pedestal today. Even if there are those that shrink back at that thought, that maybe in this moment they can say, well, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Let him examine my heart and my mind. That's the best way to let yourselves be examined is to let the Holy Spirit in your heart and your mind to yield to him, to not justify anything, but to really evaluate what it is that we have allowed in, Lord. We yield to you today and your word, which is supreme. In Jesus' name, and God's church said, amen. amen. Second Timothy chapter 3, the apostle Paul is writing to his protege. And he writes, starting in verse 16, going into 17, all scripture, say all scripture, all scripture. Now, I'm going to put something on a pedestal really quick. If you read the writings of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, what you see is Peter writes that there are those that go away, that go out of their way to pervert Paul's writing as they do the other scriptures. 
So what Peter is telling the early church is that the writings of Paul, as it's circulating through the church, is that those writings by the Jewish culture and the Christian community were recognized as being as authoritative as the other scriptures. There was no dividing line that it was just as authoritative as. So if you hear someone saying, Jesus never said anything about marriage, yes, he did, number one, but it's covered in other aspects of the word, right? If you hear Jesus didn't say stuff about tithing, yes, he did, he actually did. It's in the word, and yet we are entertaining. I'm sorry, I know I'm kind of going off a little bit, but I got to get this out. We, the culture and the church is entertaining the deceit of the enemy, which is simply put, did God really say? Did God really say that marriage is between a man and a woman? Did God really say stuff about drugs? Yes, he did in Galatians 5. And I'm kind of filling in these blanks because the culture is going to try to get you to doubt the inerrancy of Scripture. And if he can get you to doubt the things that are restrictive, then how can you identify what's permissive? Do you hear what I said? If the enemy gets you to doubt what's restrictive, then how are you going to be able to identify what's blessed? I tell you that the scriptures, they empower you to say no to ungodliness in these days. There is an equipment that the Holy Spirit gives to husbands and wives and kids to live honorably before him. Not perfectly. I know I'm flawed. My kids know I'm flawed. That's when I tell them to blame their mother. <laughs> I've never said that. That's not, that's not in my vocabulary. <laughs> she makes me shine, man. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Did you guys have that scripture up there? I feel like that, that was one of the first slides. I want, you, I want people to read this. Let me read this. Put that up there. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If I wanted to gain in health, if I wanted to gain in uh, my knowledge of what's going to make me a healthy individual, just physique-wise and, like, intake. The last person that I would want to yell at me is that bald kojak of a man, John O'Day. If you know John, he's not here today because Paige, um, we, uh, there was something that happened last night. So he's not here today. But he's a big dude. But he knows what to do. He knows, he has the knowledge of how to train his body and others in the ways of health to take care of your system and if I hire him, if I go to him, and I, and I say, train me in this way, he can train me, he can teach me, he can correct me, and he can rebuke me all he wants. But if I don't adhere to the teaching, the correcting, the rebuking, and the training, then I will see no progress. All scripture is useful in, these, in, the, in this pursuit for us in matters of righteousness. And here's the thing, church, the older I get... I don't think that I've gotten too far to where it's not necessary anymore. Actually, health-wise, I realize that the older I get, the more intentional I have to be with what I put into my system. And the same thing goes with the churches. We are adding to our resume and repertoire of life of having kids, get, well, getting married, having kids. And then later on, I've heard grandkids. You recognize that the battles that you fought when you were single, the battles that you fought when you were married, the battles that you fought when your kids were training you and establishing you for the next arena that you were going in. But we have to adhere to the teaching, the correcting, the rebuking, because we recognize that it's building us in righteousness. And the church is full of those, full of those. If you have a testimony, put your hand up and say amen. If you have a testimony, come on, don't be shy. This is the church. The church is, look to your left and right. We're full of people that have subjected themselves to the teaching and the correcting for, the, for God through the holy inspired word. They were taught, rebuked, and corrected for the arena that you're battling in right now. The source of the church as our code of conduct and the Lord's blueprint is how the church should operate is the word of God. And this is what I subject myself to. I've had to tell a married couple recently that if you don't subject yourself to this teaching, then I don't know how to counsel. This is my source. This is what I go to. So if this is not your authority and if you're not trying to drink a little bit of this water, I tell the youth all the time, if your parents are dropping you off the gym and you don't do a workout, they're going to wonder why you're gaining weight and why you're lazy. Right? 
I tell them all the time, if your parents are dropping you off in youth group and yet you're running around and you're engaging in things that are not scriptural, they're going to wonder what's going on. What are you gaining? What are you putting in? What are you taking out? Are you subjecting yourself to the teaching and the correcting and the rebuking? Because it's for our gain. It's for our benefit, right? Would you agree? There is no other source that's superior than the word. And I'm not saying that I don't subject myself to pastors and teachers who are willing to teach this word. I'm not saying that. But there, I will tell you, there's no other author, there's no other novelist or other minister that's superior than the word or the name of Jesus. None. And if they don't subject themselves to this, then I'm just not going to be their audience. You can call me and tell me what you want about me, but what I've discovered, I've told you this before, I'm very selective with how I'm built as a man and as a husband and as a father because there's plenty of sources, myself included, that know how to do it wrong. And what I want is I want to be inspired. I just don't want to be influenced. I want to be inspired. I want the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to come into my heart and mind and to have those that validate my journey through scriptures. Can I tell you a cool story? I'm going to. You're going to listen either way, right? So when I was first saved, I was 21, and my journey began in the Word of God. It didn't begin going to church. It began in my bedroom reading the Word. And after my salvation, it was so radical, man. It was so beautiful. After my salvation, I was going to Lapeer Assembly of God, and I'm like, I'm not going to be a member of no church. Uh, you know, I hear, I hear bad things. And so, you know, I'm a 22-year-old, 21 at this time, and I just think I'm so cool. And as the pastor's teaching from there, who eventually becomes my mentor, I'm on at the edge of my seat because first, he's preaching the word of God, man. He's preaching the word, and I want to receive what he's saying. And so I'm listening, and I just kept thinking, I agree with that. I agree with that. That validates my journey. That validates my journey. And what I recognize is that the Lord has blessed me and my wife with a couple that's gone before us for many years in marriage and ministry. And that there's going to be things that he can teach me because he's been in arenas that I haven't been in yet. And so to prepare me, I have to subject myself to that type of coaching. So what's, what's the diff, what, what is the final part of this? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's the thing, church, is that there's an accuser of the brethren whose sole purpose is to disarm you as a husband, to disarm you as a wife, to disarm you as a father, to disarm our children from the scriptures that are divinely inspired. That's his sole purpose. As he wants to unequip us. Did we read that scripture right? It said thoroughly equipped. The enemy wants to rob, kill, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. His sole purpose is to take from us the scriptures that can thoroughly equip. And I'm going to show you in the word where we see this. Because the whole purpose that Jesus had in communion is that the body is unified. And the enemy is trying to cast doubt. He's trying to cast silly little arguments and disputes one family to the other. Or even within the family structure. There's just silly things that we fight about. So his whole purpose is to disarm our spouses and kids of the scripture that will empower them with the authority. This is the only scripture. Jesus is the only way. His blood is the only atoning sacrifice that's made that can help them, that can help them overcome sin. That's it. And he wants to take him from this, men. He wants to take your kids, the word from your kids. That should be a big deal to us. I've asked the youth this. If I told you there's a thief coming... And I directed this to the young men in the youth group. If I told you that there was a thief that's going to break in your house tonight, would you go to sleep? Would you take a nap? What would you do? Man, they were talking about nunchucks and size and throwing stars. No, they didn't say any of that. <laughs> the youth group, it gets, it gets interesting because then they're all like posturing themselves. You know, like they're, you know, but the purpose was every single one of them said they would take arms somehow. Church, there's a thief coming. Scripture says that. He's not going to knock on your door. And if he's knocking on the door, I'd check the back. He's not going to ask your permission. Young men, he's not going to ask your permission to talk to you. He's just going to suggest something. Young men, women, there's a thief that is coming. And he wants to rob you of the scriptures and of your salvation. And if I tell you that he's coming, how are you going to arm yourself? I had this illustration with the youth, and I'm going to kind of put this out there because we're talking about, uh, I'm talking about the infallib infallibility of Scripture and how it influences 
people just to leave a repentant life before the Lord? Does it make us perfect? It puts us on a journey to aim for perfection. It makes us aware, I think, of that standard that God had put inside of every single one of us and actually makes us realize that, hey, it's obtainable. It's, it, there's things that are obtainable that I could not do before the Lord came into my life. And what I told the youth was I used, this wa- I used water as an illustration. I asked them, if you're running a race, Jimmy, let's say you're running a race in the desert, and you come to the end of the race and you see me with this water, would you drink from it? You don't see two shirts. <laughs> you're just nodding. I don't know if that's a sure yes. See, but you had, Amen, amen, yes, all right. Now, because it makes sense, you see water, you want to drink of it, right? Now, if I told you that I was some psycho and I put a little paint there in here and just mixed it up and you couldn't see it, but you still ingest it, it will affect your body. First thing that it would do is it would affect your, your esophagus, it would burn severely, it would affect your stomach intestines, you would vomit, possibly with blood. It would go to your kidneys. It would cause kidney failure. It would affect your heart and blood. This is if I put a little poison in this water and you drank it. It would cause collapse of lungs, low blood pressure. It develops rapidly. You go into shock. Severe changes in the acid level, which leads to failure of many, many, many organs. So what I'm telling you is you can't ingest a little bit of, of uh, anything that's a foreign substance that causes your central nervous system just to go haywire and have it not affect your body. If you ingest a little bit of sin, it affects the way you think, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you see. You cannot compartmentalize sin. If it's, if you're active in your life, if you've activated it, it affects every part of you. Jesus said, if you sin, you are a close. (laughs) If you sin, you are a slave to sin. It affects the entirety of your pursuit. It affects everything. A little bit of varnish in here, and all of a sudden the whole system is affected. You cannot. You cannot. But here's the thing. When we are running this race, you don't think that the enemy doesn't know that we're thirsty. You cannot adequately run this race of life and not thirst. Psalm 42 is a beautiful psalm. He writes, as the deer pants for living streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. So I'm going to ask you as we start getting a little more into this, whose cup are you drinking from? Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting to give you water? Who are you trusting to appease that thirst? Because I recognize I would drink from pastor's hand. Because I know that if he has the correct rebuke or cheat or or teach me or train me, it's for what? To train me in righteousness, right? I do recognize that there's those, if they correct or rebuke me, it's to make me feel bad and make me think that I need them in my life. And I'm not going to be manipulated like that, and you shouldn't either. I drink from Pastor Brian's hand. I'd probably gag afterwards, but I would, (laughs) I'd drink it. (laughs) Did God really say mentality? Did God really say If the enemy can get the culture to doubt what God said is restrictive, I know I said this, I'm going to put this out there, then we will not see the blessing of what is permissive. Do not just, youth, you need to hear me on this, don't just run after anybody that offers you a drink. Instagram has 64 million influencer accounts. 64 million. And the issue with this is as you guys are scrolling, as you're scrolling, you are getting influenced but you're not getting inspired divinely speaking what that means the difference is that influence is the development of character behavior on someone the way it affects the mind so we can just mindlessly numb be scrolling and suddenly we're thinking things and we're entertaining this did God really say did God really say that the marriage is between a man and woman did God really say that he was gonna is our promises sustaining yes they are absolutely they are 64 million opportunities for you to be influenced and yet still be uninspired. What's the point? Suddenly we're walking and talking and acting and behaving like the poison is in our system. We're thinking things that originally maybe a week or two ago we weren't trained to think that way because we subject ourselves to 64 million teachers with other ideas. And the enemy wants to rob you. You know what? He doesn't even knock anymore. He doesn't even need to knock anymore, does he? We invite him in. We live in a culture where we look for influence before inspiration. I want those that inspire me to influence me. 
I want those that inspire me. The definition of inspire is to fill someone with the urge or ability to do something. So I'm telling you guys that this word is the standard. And I'm going to get there. Go ahead and turn to John 17. This is, the, this is the, a standard by definition. I said this a little while ago. Is, is basically a unit of measurement. Think like a measuring tape. So if I'm building a house, and I've, this is what I've taught the youth on, and I'm going to choose someone to build with me, I'm going to choose someone that's going to use the same standard as me. My uncle, he is a, well, you just build everything, right? Just do everything, right? I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him to come to my house, help me. Um, Jake up there, I know, J- I know Jake does stuff. I trust him to help build. Chris, I know Chris builds. I would, tr- I would trust Chris. But in a marriage, I was very selective with who's going to hold the other end of that measuring tape. Because this is the measuring rod. This is the standard for our marriage. So that way I know when I'm not around and she's building something, I don't have to come home and just be flabbergasted. I don't have to be in awe of what she did. Like, this is not a part of what we signed up for. Because I know that the measuring stod for her as a woman and for her as a wife and for her as a mother is the word of God. And guess what complements that, men? Same exact thing, opposite gender, right? Absolutely. Even in my friendships, I recognize, Pastor Brian, I'm recognizing that even in my, in, my, my, my friendships, I can be influenced. And so I use this book as my standard for the foundation of anything that I'm trying to establish. And you say, what if I built? What if I built and it crumbled? Then you should still be standing on a strong foundation. The enemy, the, Jesus basically said that there's going to be times where something might, might crumble in your life. The purpose of this is to create a union. The purpose of this that Jesus says is to create a union that is a strong bond of the word of God at the center. That's been the target of the assault from the beginning in Genesis 2, which we'll get to in just a second. But to understand the union that Jesus desires for us to have is illustrated best in John 17, which they should, they should have that up. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them, say all of them, all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I think that this just changes the whole standard of union in my mind. When I'm thinking of Jesus and the Father, I see them as inseparable. I see them as one. One's in heaven, one's on earth. And they were inseparable. And it's funny because like when you read that, you're just like, you, it's like my mind gets it, but it doesn't grasp it. Do you know what I'm saying? That type of union. He says, may they also be in us. And now he, this is the invitation is that he's not keeping us apart from him. He's inviting the church. He's inviting those that are going to be called into that same union. He says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I'm going to make a quick point and I'm going to draw attention to it later on. What can solidify can also disunify. I don't know if disunify is a word, but that's what I'm putting out there. What can solidify something is the very same thing that can break people apart. The very item that can create connection can adversely bring contention. For example, I'm a Michigan Wolverine fan, and trust me when I say I am weeping with you Michigan State fans this year. Not really, though. <laughs> but what's the point? What's the point? We both, we, we like football, right? But you see how one common thing can cause such a division or a separation, right? Right? You see what I'm saying here? The very item that's intended to cause the testimony of the union of Christ and his church is the most contentious topic in today's culture, marriage between a man and a woman. It's the most contentious thing. Marriage is the thing that we're standing, you're either standing on one side of the aisle or you're not. There's not a gray area anymore. Jesus' statement was that we have a union together that is complete in him. He gives us a model that has been under attack since the beginning that the enemy knew if he could cause separation between Adam and his wife that it would cause confusion as to what complete unity really looks like. If the word of God is useful in teaching, training, correcting, and rebuking in all matters of righteousness and Jesus is desired that we're unified, what's the assault going to be on? The word of God and marriage. 
the union of marriage. I'm going to draw the significance of this because I'm not getting that many amens. I'm telling you, church, that the image of man and woman, scripturally speaking, I, I'm going to jump ahead again. That the image of man and woman unified in marriage is symbolic of Christ in the church. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. It's for people to acknowledge that what I'm saying is scriptural. Come on. I'm going to make a statement, and I'm not trying to be controversial, but I'm going to draw your attention to something. A couple weeks ago, I, I was praying before reading, and I, just was, and I just asked the Lord, like, hey, just blow my mind today. Give me something that I've never really read, and I'm reading through the Old Testament right now. And this is, this is the statement. I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm going to show you what I mean. In the beginning, it was not Adam and Eve that walked with God in the cool of the day. In the beginning, it was not Adam and Eve. You ready? Go to Genesis chapter 2. In this scripture, we read, Man gives name to all the livestock, the birds in the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no, help, no suitable helper. Everyone say helper. I know you've heard me preach this before, but for those of you that haven't, that, that Hebrew word is ezer, E-Z-E-R, or I think it's spelled E-Z-A-R, uh, in, other, in other ways. This means not someone who is subordinate and is just supposed to come alongside and help him. This is a, it's a deeper meaning. It's a compliment. It means to make whole. It, it is a completion of an image. When God gave man, um, when God created man and he gave Eve, you see an image of God in both of them. And so what we see right now is that when he gets his helper, or when he gets no helper, no, no suitable helper was found. Sorry. So God puts Adam into a great sleep. Adam wakes and his eyes gaze upon his complement, his other part. He sees his wife. And he doesn't name her individually. He doesn't name her as he does the other livestock. He doesn't name her as the birds of the air or the pigs in the pen. He says this is, he's poetic, man. This is awesome. He says this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh that she shall be called woman. Right? Not Eve. See, he did not give his wife a name, Eve, until after the fall. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 is where you read this. Genesis 3, 20, Adam names his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Up until this point in creation, man and woman have a dignified, a very special view to all of other creation that no other creation was given. Despite there being... Uh, male, female parts and all, and all the livestock and birds and stuff, man and woman were dignified as being one. Not separate identities in marriage, but that they were unified, that they were in union together. And now when Jesus is saying that you're supposed to be one as the Father and I are one, there's not an individualistic idea, but that the church is the bride of Christ and together we are one. That we are one in complete union with him. At this point, there's not an identifiable distinction. And then listen to what he says. We've got to get the scripture just to get with where I'm going. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. I think Pastor quoted that in his, pr in his prayer. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Cool little notation. The Hebrew word um, of wife is isha. It means woman belonging to or married to a man. Adam and Eve were married. They were married. Eve didn't get that identity and that name separate from her husband until after sin entered into humanity. Think of the way the culture is right now. Eve didn't wake from her, didn't wake Adam up from his nap and be like, why aren't you working? You know, we got stuff to do around the house. <laughs> Adam didn't wake up and just question the Lord. No, he got poetic. He saw his wife as his, as, as his equal, as a part of him, as a part that was from him. Adam's response was not to give her a name as he named the other animals, but to acknowledge that she was a part of who he is. Adam and his wife had the distinguished role of being unified in a way that no other creation has, was given. We have created a culture that questions and doubts the very significance of this type of union. That's what we are a part of church, so what do we got to give them? We got to give them a model that is worth applauding and saying, that's what I'm talking about. It's our responsibility. Why? Because God chose us. 
He chose the church to be the vehicle that's going to advance the gospel into sinful humanity. Does it mean that you fall short? Sometimes you do, right? Does it mean that you're imperfect? Yeah, sometimes we are. The closer people are to us, the more we start to they see that within us. So we've got to, we have to, in this hostile environment, people are rejecting this model. And then we see in the fall, the serpent was more crafty than other wild animals the Lord God made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat of the tree of the garden? And I'm going to keep going. The woman replies and says, we must eat the fruit from the trees of the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent says to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Quick notation. I think I said this a couple of years ago. But I want, you to, I want to point out to you that the temptation to Eve was not lustful images. Was it? It wasn't alcohol. It wasn't a demonic teaching. What the enemy, finally that hook was. The fruit, it was just the vice that the enemy used. But what did he appeal to her? Wisdom. Gaining knowledge. Right? Did you, did you hear this? Adam's wife was tempted by the mention of enlightenment. The appeal to the senses to the fruit was, was the vice that he used. And the enemy is targeting this union that has a deep contextual meaning that we can give place into our words I mean, it is just so incredibly deep. It's so hard to unearth, like, completely. Because the Lord's wisdom is so fast, so vast, and so far beyond ours. But I'm going to tell you, if Adam and Eve were just two people having a good time, if it was just a civil union, whatever that is, if your marriage was just as equal to that, then why is it under assault? Why is it under attack? Of all the battles I've told the youth, your generation is going to be one of sexual identity of all things. Of all the battles that we could be fighting in a culture and all the flags that we could be waving, yes, the American flag, but all the other flags, it's about sexual identity. Why is this the assault? Because the meaning is deeper than what it is just stated, uh, than what we can just think. Listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united. Say united. One. Be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In the New Testament, Paul cites the identity that Adam and his wife had before the beginning, before the fall. And he's saying that this is the reason that you leave, that you might find this type of union. He references the intent from the very beginning prior to the fall, when it was Adam and his wife, and sources the reason. The type of union that God has designed for man and woman is part of a profound mystery. And it's to be as Christ and the church. But we are engaging a culture that is asking, did God really say? And here's where it is, church. We don't have to panic. All we got to do is say yes. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. I'm not trying to get anybody to follow some false ideal that's empty. I did that for 21 years of my life. And then Christ comes, and I'm telling you, when that union happened between me and his life, why would I not want to kill every other hanging piece of fruit that's a vice that the enemy can use to draw my attention to him to be able to say, did God really say? Did God really say your wife is faithful? Did God really say that, that, that you have hope as a father? You're a failure as a father. You're a failure as a husband, man. You don't meet all the needs. Did God really say that stuff? No. That's not scripture correcting, teaching me and rebuking me in the ways of righteousness. That's the deceit and the lie of the enemy that's trying to cast doubt on what God has been doing in my life. Amen, church? We're going to prepare for communion. Can I get the worship team up here? And the heartbeat of today, I feel, is that union for you, that if you feel you have been separated, if the enemy has caused the divide, you know what, we can't even blame the enemy all the time. We're not going to be able to blame the enemy when we go before the throne for judgment. We can't say the devil made me do it. But if we recognize in our own spirits and our own hearts that we have been separate from Christ and you want that union, I'm going to ask that as, we, as the worship team begins to play, and I have you stand, that, that you would take the scripture literally and let the Holy Spirit examine it. Would you stand?
Ushers, can I get you to come forward? Now with eyes closed, we're gonna take a moment while, while the worship team plays. And as they play, I'm gonna ask the pastor and myself, I just want eyes closed. This is between you and Jesus right now. If you feel you need that union with Christ, whether you have walked away and you're coming back or you feel like even right now in your pew, like this is something that you need. As the worship team plays, just slip your hand up and just put it down. We're going to be watching. So just take a minute. 